All right, you may be seated. Glory to God. All right, well, well, well. We're in Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, you know, uh, after Jesus had finished his, uh, 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 after Luke had finished uh, Jesus' version of uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6, you know, he enters Capernaum uh, uh, where uh, Luke now records some of the extraordinary faith uh, that was uh, displayed by a Roman officer and, and as uh, uh, we see him showing that the Gentiles was always uh, included uh, in God's family. And, 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 and we see how important faith is when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. And then, you know, he goes on and uh, uh, this story that we began with kind of parallels and puts you in the mind of what was recorded uh, by the Roman officer and uh, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So we see this tonight as a precursor to what would happen again later on when Jesus was commissioning them after the day of Pentecost to go out and start spreading the word to all nations. And, and, and so uh, tonight we pick up uh, in, in, in chapter one, uh, in chapter seven, verse one, he says this, he says, when Jesus had finished saying all these, all this to the people. What he had finished saying was that powerful sermon in the ch chapter before. Again, connecting to the Sermon on the Mount. He returned to Capernaum. Capernaum was like a home station for him, a home base that, you know, when he went out, he always came back to certain regions. At this time, it served as a home base. And at that time, he says, Look, at, the, at that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So we see here in that this officer is making a request. And he's making that request through uh, other Jews, Jews that probably were favorable to Jesus and Jews that he probably had a relationship with. Now, this is a Roman officer, and he's obviously a person of notoriety and of note because he got servants. He got people that work for him. And so apparently one of his servants, and, and again, it just let, let us know that he must have had a good relationship with this servant, you know, because the Bible said he was, you know, highly, highly valued, you know, uh, and, and, and therefore he wanted him healed. He wanted him to be healed, and he knew that Jesus could do it. So if this servant or slave, however we want to read this, was of no value, he would have just let the dude die. Just let him die. But he had heard about Jesus, and so Jesus' notoriety was still moving and still picking up, and he heard about Jesus. Now, the result of hearing about Jesus, he figured that, hey, I have enough faith to believe that Jesus can heal my servant. So now he sent this group of people uh, uh, of Jews who could relate to Jesus to make a request on his behalf. And we're going to see here in a minute why he did that because, you know, he, he, he was kind of favorable to the Jews, kind of like Cornelius was. You know, Cornelius showed favor to him and he prayed and did things like that and his prayers went up to God and therefore as a result of that, Peter was sent to Cornelius' house. And so now we see another Roman officer who seems to have embraced some of the things that the Jewish culture was believing in. And so now look at this. In, in verse uh, 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 4 and 5, look at this, this plea. He says, so they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said. You know, they making a plea. Then he says, for he loved the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So this was not the average, typical Roman. You know, because at that time, you know, the Jews didn't care too much for the Romans because they was being oppressed by the Romans and they was under Roman occupation. So therefore, for this guy to do this and be able to help them build a synagogue, he must have had some type of relationship with the Jews, even though he was a Gentile. And so again, just proving the point that God is not a respecter person. 
So he'd been listening and sitting around Jews and listening to how they do things and what they talk about, how they worship. He may have started believing some of the things that they believe. But now he goes a step further and is going to start believing in the one who a lot of them rejected. And let's follow this. He says now, so Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some other friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. Well, well I'm not worthy of you to come to my house. Now, we done kind of heard that story with Zacchaeus and some of the others that people think they're not worthy, but Jesus ain't got no problem dealing with unworthy people. But look at this. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. For just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I mean, that's a display of faith right there. Now, this is not someone who was brought up in the Jewish religion and understood all about the Messiah coming that the other Jews should have known and understood. This is somebody who had been around them and had embraced what they believed and had enough faith to believe that Jesus would just say the word from where you are and my servant will be a heel. Now, we see also here that this man understood authority, Major, because he said, for I know this because I am under the authority of my superiors and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go, a come and they come. And if I say to my slave, do this, they do it. So this man, look, believing that because he understood this concept of this principle of authority, that Jesus had authority over situations that he could just speak certain things and it'll happen. I mean, that's some serious faith right there. I mean, your servant's sick and all of a sudden now you say, hey, I'm not even worthy of you to come to my house. Just say the word. And, 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 and what you're going to see here is that because of that level of faith, Jimmy, faith can be recognized. You know, because Jesus came back and said, in verse 9 and, and, uh, uh, through 10, it says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Man, when you can say some things and cause Jesus to be amazed, you must be making a pretty bold declaration. I mean, you know, turning to the crowd that was following him, we see that this crowd, Jesus always got these folk following him. You know, some followed him because of the work that he was doing out of curiosity. Some was following him because they truly had become believers in him. And then there was some like the Pharisees following him just to stir up things just to keep something going. But he says now, when they heard this, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed, turning to the crowd that was following him and said, I tell you, I haven't seen such faith like this in all of Israel. And that's a pretty bold declaration for Jesus to make by a, a Gentile, a, a Roman at that, that, hey, his faith was so strong and, 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 and so evident that Jesus said, and throughout all Israel, I hadn't seen. Man, you know, there were a lot of folks in Jews who were following Jesus, but obviously their faith was not as strong as this Roman. And so that's why in the Bible you'll see that sometimes people are classified as having, you know, great faith, little faith, strong faith. So faith looks like it can come in degrees. You know, everybody may not be operating in great faith, a strong faith. Because one time he had said, oh, ye of Little faith. So long as you got it, it can grow. But you got to have it. Major, go ahead. Pastor, he had, he had such great faith, but why, why did he feel himself to be worthy, though? Why, because he was a Gentile? You know, it, it Major, it don't give us a good reason why he felt he was unworthy. And it could be because, again, how the Jews looked at the Romans and the fact that he was part of an occupying force and, and people could have looked at him, hey, I'm not worried because of what my people are doing to your people, you know, in this way. So I'm not worried for you to come to my house. Maybe he did have been doing some things, but it looks like at the same time that he was doing some good things with, for the Jews. Yeah. But for whatever reason, 
he felt like he wasn't worthy for Jesus to come to his house. You know, and, 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 and so sometimes I think that, that, that a lot of times, I think Zacchaeus even had a little problem too, you know, when Jesus was going to his house. You know, and, 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 and maybe because people are doing certain things that, hey, I ain't, you know, maybe I ain't worthy just to go to church yet. You know, I ain't worthy. I'm, I'm, I'm still out here doing these things in these streets, man. I ain't, you know, I, I ain't worthy to set foot in the doors of the church, man. Well, that's what I'm doing. But, but they shouldn't allow that to keep them from coming to the place they need to be. But, but this man said, because of that, I still have enough faith to believe that you can just say the word. Wow. And, 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 and so look at this. Following, when, when, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and turned to the crowd following him. He said, I tell you true, I haven't seen a faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. Wow. So Jesus' words had power. But it was the man's faith that caused Jesus to speak those words. Right. See, well, we got to understand our faith can move the hand of God. Amen. You know, he will respond to our faith. And that's how we have to walk by faith and not by sight. And we have to have confidence that our God can do some things that we may not even think possible. Amen. Put the ball in his court. And whether he do it or not, it's on him. But at least we ought to have the faith to believe that we can put our trust and hope in him because he said he would never leave us nor forsake us. And that he's, and with him all things are. And so the man was healed. Now after that, now again, Luke started to record more of Jesus' miracles. Now we see another miracle that Jesus is about to perform when it comes to raising this widow's son. I'm in verse 11. It says, soon afterwards, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nam, Nain, and a large crowd followed him. That seemed to be a consistent theme right now. Everywhere Jesus went, he had a following. Amen. And again, just because he had a following don't mean that all in the crowd was for him. So therefore, I, I look at this just because we can get a large crowd at a place, even in church, it don't necessarily mean that everybody is operating on the same the level of faith and same belief system and, and, and trust in the Lord to the same degree. It's all good they're part of the crowd, but there are sometimes people may be coming just to argue with the scripture. And instead of receiving the scripture and trusting the scripture to be true, they want to argue with the scripture. But then every now and then there's some people just come in because they're curious about the scripture, you know. Others go to church, I've heard about it, I just want to go. But then there's some people who truly come and receive this word, let it go in their hearts, take root, and then start living what they have heard. Amen. No different than when Jesus gave the parable of the soil and the seed. That seed fell on four different types of people. And all of them responded to the word in a different way. I believe that when people come to church on Sunday, all people, I'm not saying there are four types of people that probably sit in the church. Amen. Some going to get the word with joy, jump up and down and shout, have a good time, and then go out and ain't got no root. And then when something happens, hey, I ain't going back there. You know, then there's going to be some, you know, who going to get this word major. And, you know, before it can take root, it's going to be trying. But some going to come up and just choke it right out of you know, then there are going to be some that may let it take time and grow and then do the things that they learn. Amen. And so at the end of the day, when we look at this, it's all about us being doers of the word and not just hearers only. Amen. Faith is an action word, so we have to act on our faith. And so here it says, Jesus had this crowd following him. And then he says, a funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. And you kind of got to get the picture of how they proceeded with funerals during that time. You know, probably a casket type inch box of some sort with the body there. And a lot of times when you look at it in the, in the Arab countries right now, after somebody, they be open. You know, they just be marching down the street with them open. So I'm I believe that that's kind of how it was done back in those days. 
because, you know, folks, uh, during that time, you know, you had to be buried right away. So when you died, they, they ain't waste no time. You know, today we take two, three weeks, you know, but because we can embalm folks. But back then, most time, funerals had to take place before the sun go down, okay? And, and so therefore, this procession was going, and, and, and they approached the Billy Gate. Then it says, the young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. In other words, there were people that were with her, uh, showing their compassion and love for her, and there were some people that were, that were just mourners, you know, because, you know, in the Bible, they have mourners. They had people who showed up at funeral. They call them whalers. And they, they mourned. They grieved. They cried. They let you know that sorrow was on the scene. And so now we see this, that this crowd, and when the Lord saw her, look here, his heart was overflowed with com What is compassion? What does compassion mean to you? When you hear that compassion, what does it mean to have compassion? Passion on somebody. Anybody, your answer is your answer. I'm just asking a question. When the Lord saw her, so it looked like sometimes we can see certain things that ought to cause our heart to move. He shared a pain, okay. Okay. Anybody else? Feeling of sympathy, empathy, okay. Uh, 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 for her and her suffering. And you know, one thing, it's one thing to feel somebody's pain, but it's another thing to do something about it. I mean, sometimes people don't just need for us to feel sorry for them. They need us to do something. And sometimes it don't always mean you got to do something where you're giving money and all that. Sometimes compassion is just being there for folk. Just listening to folk. And, and, and so, but the Bible says his heart overflowed with compassion. You know, don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. Now, Jesus kind of broke one of those old, those old laws right there because, you know, there was something dead in there. And under the whole system, if you touched something or came near something that was dead, it would be considered defiling you. And so Jesus obviously didn't have no problem touching something that was dead. And I'm pretty sure the religious leaders had a serious problem with that. Because in their mind, now he has just done something that now he's defiled and he got to go through this purification ritual because he's defiled there. But Jesus had already told us who he was in the earlier chapters. He, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And, and, and so therefore, he, you know, so he walked over and touched it and the bearer stopped. Then he says, young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Just his word. Now, Major, let's stop right there for a minute. Now, we read that in the Bible, and we, and we as Christians, by faith, have to accept that. And we have to accept that. So now, I just ask, those of you online, because the folks in here, they probably do. But I think there are a lot of people that come to church that really can't accept that as faith. Right? They read it, but in their mind, they can't wrap their mind around Jesus going over to somebody dead and just say, get up. It's a nice little story, Major. And it makes good commentary in a religious setting. But do you really believe it in your heart that he had the power to just say, get up? There are a lot of things in this Bible that we read that really stretch our natural thinking. Amen. Amen. And see, with someone in the natural, oh, they'll make it well. When people have a problem with stuff like this, well, that's just an allegorical little story. It don't necessarily have to be true. It's just a story to just show you the power. It don't, mean, it don't necessarily have to mean that he really. But the Bible say, he said, get up. Get up. Now, as believers, we have to really truly believe that by faith, even though we didn't see it. And we just can't read this and just, just say it to be saying it. We have to really think that that thing happened just like that. Because if you can't believe that happened right there, then how are you going to believe in a resurrection that you ain't never seen nobody got up from? Our whole system of belief is centered around Jesus getting up from the dead. And we're hoping that one day he's going to come back and we're going to get up too. 
Because if not, then when we die, then it's just it. We might as well be like the rest of the world. Major, why even be here on Wednesday night? Because your faith is going to be the same as somebody else out there who don't even come to church. But we have faith to believe that one day t- we too going to get up. Amen. Ms. Myrna, I'm sorry. I was at work and I was discussing something about the word and I mentioned the word and I mentioned Jesus. And one of my co-workers looked around and she said, well, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that name. I said, you don't? She said, no. What do you think? I'm Jew. And he didn't, and we still waiting for him to come. I said, well, yes, he's coming again. But he came already. He came for you and me. But I'm really sorry to know that you don't believe. And she said, well, I don't, I saw when I, they had a co-worker tell her, she said, you don't believe in that man that came and walked on the earth and died for us? And she said, no, because she's Jew, and she know that they're still waiting for Jesus to come. Amen. Some of them are. And there are some what they call messianic Jews out there, people who have embraced Jesus and the resurrection and his first coming. But there are a lot of Jews who don't believe he's already come, so therefore they're waiting on him to come. And, and, and so that's what we disagree with them at. Because in our faith, we believe he's already come. And when he's coming back, when he comes back, he's not coming to do the same thing he did when he came the first time. You see, the first time he came to seek, seeking to save him, this time he's coming back to get us and then judge some folk. And, and, and so therefore, but that's an argument that was going to go on till he come back. Now, you know, on that argument side, not only just Jews with, 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 with Muslims and, and, and other religions, they find saving grace to believe that there is one big Allah, a God, sitting up there. We just on different paths going to the same God. And, 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 and that makes sense to them. That's logical. Yes. Same God. You just call him God, Jehovah. We just call him Allah. Same God. He's the same dude. And we all just going up different sides of the mountain to the same place. And our only concern is that, but do y'all have to go through Jesus to get to the top of the mountain? And so in their mind, Jesus was no more than just another prophet. So if we keep Jesus at that level as just a great prophet, then we wouldn't have no argument with a lot of Jewish people because they can accept him as that, but they can't accept him as the Messiah who has already come. So he says, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A almighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited us today. So they saw Jesus as a great prophet. You know, kind of like, you know, in their mind, they may have been thinking about Elijah and Elijah, because both of them had episodes where they raised somebody. If you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Kings, First and second king, you'll find story. So they probably say, Jesus is a great prophet. A great prophet of the month. They can accept that, Major. But they can't accept that the prophet could also be the Savior. But we can accept that he is a great prophet and he has visited us today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding area. Now, the reason that this was such a blessing for this woman is because during that time, women had very little rights and they could make very little income. So therefore, if she had a son and she was a widow, he would have been responsible for her. So when he died, her lifestyle was going to change dramatically. She probably going to become a beggar if she didn't have other people that could take care of her. So now Jesus is performing, bringing her son back, but he's also being a blessing to her livelihood. And so when we look at this and we see Jesus do this, we understand that any time he did works like that, the Bible said the news spread. Good news is supposed to spread. When the Lord do something good for us, it's supposed to spread. 
It is not designed. At the beginning of Luke, he told them that why he came, you know, to preach the gospel to the poor, the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind. You know, he came to spread this good news. We saw that at the very beginning. And so now that that is happening, today we have that same charge. We got to get it out there because Jesus is not going to come back and walk the earth like he did then. We are his commission one. The one who, who he have commissioned to go there for and make disciples. Amen. Okay? And we do that by sharing with them the good news. Now look at this. This next section, Luke kind of shifts and starts talking about this dialogue between, you know, something between Jesus and John the Baptist. Now y'all know from the beginning of this that Jesus and John was really kin. John was the one that baptized Jesus. The one that saw heaven open up, dove descending, and heard the voice say, this is my beloved son, who I'm well pleased. So John had a relationship with Jesus, but John had his own following too. You know, John had a ministry. He was out there doing what he do. Jesus had a ministry. He was doing what he do. John was that radical guy major that would go into the king and say, hey, you a low-down dog. You done took your brother's wife, sleeping with her and all that. Well, John was bold like that, but he ended up in jail. And when he got in jail, he want to know, who are you? Are you the one we looking for? Or am I looking for her? I baptize you, I don't know. But now I'm in, in jail. And so that's kind of the, the backdrop. You got to follow this when you think about this and we read this. I hope you can kind of get this picture. But Jesus, now in the end, he's going to defend John. But he's going to say some things. If you don't know the whole story, look like he was kind of taking a jab at, at John. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. In verse 18, I call this the perplexing question in 18 through 20. Then the disciples of John the Baptist, so John, I told you, had his own disciples, told John about everything that Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we be looking for someone else? Now, Major, as I just said, you would have thought that question would never come from John's mouth. When John was a baby in the womb and, and Mary came around his mama and Jesus in the womb, John, John heard it and jumped. And he knew that he was the forerunner of Jesus. But it looked like now he's asking the question, are you the one? Or should I be looking for someone? Maybe John was expecting Jesus to be something different than what he was. Like a lot of Jews. They were expecting someone who's going to ride in. Because if you ride in now, you can get me out of this jail cell. You, you, can get, you can get me off death row. But you know, the story is, you know, John, yeah, his fate was not good. But he stood up for what he believed. So now look at this. He says, so now with that pressure on him, he says, should we keep looking for someone else? John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Now, again, John frustrated in prison on death row. Maybe he just got clouded, Major. Because this don't sound like the same John that was at the beginning where he was, you know, preaching repentance. Baptizing Jesus. But now in prison, he got some questions. And it looks like sometimes when life put pressure on you, you can have some questions. I mean, you start questioning something that you always say you've been believing in. But now that he's under pressure, he has some questions. And I don't fault John for asking that question. Because sometimes when things happen in our lives, we ask God a question, where were you? You know, I was reading an article the day about the flood up there, and, and uh, it was saying that they recorded, and I, I didn't read the whole article, 
but a, 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 a child that got swept in a, swept away in the flood. And as he was being swept away, they say he was calling on the name of Jesus. Now, from all indication, the child didn't live. So someone could hear and read that and say, why would he call on somebody that couldn't get him out of that war? So the question is, when life hits your heart, who you going to call on? Whether he do what you want him to do or not, who you going to call on? And so someone on the other side may say, yeah, see, he shouldn't have never been believing anyway. Why believe in a Jesus that can't even deliver you? Then that's when we as Christians have to defend the hope that we believe in. We have to know that even in the Bible during Jesus' time, everybody that he was around didn't live. Some people died while he was on the scene. And so those are the type of things that if we don't have a solid foundation, we could find ourselves just like John. Are you really the Savior? And are you capable of working miracles? Hmm. Or should I be looking for someone else? Wow. It's just easy for us right now because, you know, we sitting in here. Now look at this. Let's go back and read. John, two disciples, found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the Messiah? We've been expecting that expectation is there, or should we be looking for someone else? At, the very, at that very time, Jesus cured many people uh, of their diseases and illnesses. And he cast out evil spirits. We saw it, just giving a, 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 a background of what Jesus was doing. And he restored sight to many who were blind. Then Jesus told John's disciple, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. Jesus said, go back and tell John all the things I'm doing. And then let him determine whether I'm the Messiah or not. Because even if I don't move in his situation and get him off death row, I'm still who I say I am. I know that don't make sense, does it? You know. But John had a question, and Jesus came and asked. Now look at this in verse 20. And tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. In other words, God bless those who don't lose faith in him. You know, God's blessing would come on those who accepted Jesus' credentials because he was telling his resume there and believed in him rather than being caught and trapped by their false expectation and then have to run the possibility of missing him completely. In other words, we saw that word expect up there in the verbiage so it could have meant what we said earlier that maybe John had an expectation that he felt like was not met. And because that expectation was not met that caused him to question the very thing that he was preaching about. The very one that he was preaching about. But Jesus cut him some slack now because he's he going to say some things here you know, in, in, in this, that, that, uh, because some of the people probably started talking, thinking that, you know, John wasn't really who he said was, that John, John may not have been the man y'all thought he was after he said that. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all follow this. He says, after John's disciples left, Jesus began talking about him. Who is the him? Talking about John. See, I done said some things about John, but now his disciples go, let me talk to the crowd about John. Talking about him to the crowds. 
Then he asked this question, Major, you in the crowd? Jesse, you in the crowd? You know, <laughs> Rob, you in the crowd? He says, what kind of man do you, did, what kind of man did you, did you go, no, what kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Talking to the crowd. Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? So these were people who had known John and followed him. And so Jesus asked them a question. What kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a man who was just being tossed to and fro by every wind that came along? What did you see in John when you were with him in the wilderness? Now look at this. Because that when you look up that word reed and, and, and sway, you know, these are the little things that kind of sit on the banks of the rivers. And, you know, they're very flimsy. And so Jesus is just saying, was John a flimsy dude? Not because coming to John. He asked them, you follow him? Was he a flimsy dude? And the point he's going to try to make is that if he was flimsy, he wouldn't be in the predicament that he's in right now. If he was just some dude who just went along to get along and went back and forth, he wouldn't have never confronted the king about messing with his brother's wife. No shaky reed going to do that. So he said, look, so, so you, do you know what kind of man that you went in the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expected to see a man dressed in expensive clothing? Well, you know John's story, Major. John was running around out there with wild hair, camel hair on <laughs> And eating honey and oats and wild weeds. And, I mean, John was doing, now look at, y'all got to get this, because this is the power of what Jesus is doing here. Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothing? No people who bear witness, who wear beautiful clothes and live in, uh, in, a, in luxury are found in palaces. No, he said. People who wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury, you don't find them in the wilderness. You find them in palaces. So obviously, John wasn't some person of great notoriety because he out there running around in the woods. And he wasn't even wearing a, you know, major, he wasn't even wearing a Gucci coat, a Gucci pair shoe. You know, he didn't even have... He didn't even have a Prada on, you know what I mean? <laughs> John, John had on just Levi's. $9.99 Levi's. Rough cut Levi's. That's the type of dude you were going out there to see. Now look at this contrast. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes. And he said, and he is more than a prophet. Jesus said, now, if you were looking for a prophet, John was more than a prophet because they only knew of me. John was there to bear witness of me and to tell you about me because he was the forerunner. So there he was more than a prophet. He says, John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I am sending a messenger ahead of you and he will prepare the way before you. So I said, John had a powerful assignment. He building John up on one side. Now look at this. Y'all got to follow this because he's he going to come back and flip the script here in a minute. He says, I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Then he had to put yet in there. Maybe that yet stopped me. And I had to go and read and back and forth. Jesus, you, you know, you don't pump John up. And then he says, uh, I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Talking about the prophets now, you know, all who the prophets, they got to keep it in contact. Because if not, this next part will mess you up. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. And that's <laughs> Now, you know, he done built John up. <laughs> then now he said, hey, Major, you are greater than John. Because John only knew up until a point. John was executed before he saw the resurrection. 
resurrection. He was executed before he saw the cross. And he says, those of you who are least in the kingdom is greater than John because you have experience and you know more than you. That's powerful right there, man. He, that's us. Because we didn't see none of this. But, and so therefore we believe in something that we didn't see. And so therefore Jesus said, hey, but we know the end of the story. John didn't know that before he died. He just had to carry the message that the one who you've been looking for has come, but then I won't live, didn't live long enough to see the end of the story. Now look at this. Verse 29. When they heard this, all the people, even the tax collectors, agreed that God's way was right, for they had been baptized by John. Now get this. John's baptism was about repentance. He baptized people unto repentance. In other words, John's message was, hey, he's coming. Turn away from your sins and be baptized. Jesus' message was greater than just baptism. His was also about salvation of being saved and the resurrection. He says, but they believed that what John preached about Jesus was right. Now look here, Major, but there's always these Pharisees in the crowd. But the Pharisees and experts in religious law rejected God's plan for, for them, for they had refused John's baptism. In other words, they felt that because they saw themselves as being righteous, there was no need for them to repent. Right. And you know, that's what it's like when we can get caught up in self-righteousness. And you know, and, and, and sometimes when we, we get caught up in our own ways and self-righteousness, then we elevate ourselves to a level that God don't want us to be at. And so therefore, repentance is still applicable to all of us today. Amen. Every now and then, we do some things that we need to repent from. We need to tell God we're sorry. We need to acknowledge that, hey, I was wrong. And then we need to just repent and move on. Because we believe that he will forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. But we got to live in a way where we don't get so caught up in our own self that we don't think that we do no wrong. And we all do wrong. Either knowingly or unknowingly, we probably do some things. Right. Amen. And I think if we will be honest with ourselves when we look in that mirror and do self-reflection every now and then, the Holy Spirit will reveal some things to us. Amen. That's his job, to correct us, to rebuke us, to teach us, to lead us, to guide us. And so, there were some Pharisees who refused John's baptism. Now look at this. In verse 31, he says, To what can I compare the people of this generation? Talking about you, you know, y'all y'all folks who are sitting out there, I need to compare y'all to something. I need to give y'all some light, what y'all like. Try to find what y'all like. And so I can bring into focus what, how, how you really are. So he says, can I compare the people of this generation? Talk about those people that were there in that time. And we can always do some comparing with our generation. Every generation can be compared to something. Right. Amen. And then he says, now Jesus asked, how can I describe them? Man. Then he goes to give this analogy. He says, they are like little Children playing a game in the public square. Whatever you want to play. Play whatever game you want to play. Baseball, jacks, whatever. You're playing a game in the public square. And you're playing a game that you ought to enjoy playing. Major, you love golf. Amen. And so because you love it, you ought to enjoy playing it. So he said, they are like children who are playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends. Man, you're out here every week, but you're complaining. You ought to 
while you're out there, he said, look, they complain their friend. <laughs> we played wedding songs and you didn't dance. Mm-mm-mm. Man, we played music while you're out there in the square. Song that you should have had joy and you didn't even dance. Then he said, we played funeral song and you didn't even cry. Man, I done showed you two extremes. You should be dancing or you should have been, been crying. Now look at this. And he's using this to make this comparison how, how, how John and him lives contrasted. His life contrasted, if you follow what I'm saying. Because he said, now, we done did this. Y'all like little kids. Play ball, but you weren't happy. Then now, Something sad that should have made you sad, and you ain't even weep. Like little kids, like children. He said, now look, after he talked about them to in that degree, using that analogy, he says, for John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread and drinking wine. Gonna contrast. And, and you say, he is possessed by a demon. He a madman, as some of your Bible say. John's mad. John didn't spend no time eating. And in other words, he's saying, look, John wasn't a party of major. John was out in the wilderness with wild oats and honey, walking around with camel hair on. Man, John was the epitome of what holiness looked like. He don't go to the parties. He don't drink no wine. Don't get his hair cut. John was the epitome of holiness. I mean, John was out there. He didn't even go around. Before. People came to John. And he was out in the wilderness. And y'all said he was a madman. He, you know that some people that's on that extreme we done met before that done came up to you. We, just back in my day, we just called them holy rollers. You know, they had the Bible in their hand. All the time. They catch you on the elevator, and before you know you don't want, you see them, don't get on the elevator. Don't, don't get on the elevator. Before you get off, you're going to get whipped. You're going to get a good whipping with that Bible. You know, if you don't, you don't come around, you're going to get a, so I used to run from them. You know, at one extreme. Run from them, because you, you know, just didn't, didn't want to be around them. They was too holy for me. I, at that time, I wasn't trying to live nothing. So I definitely want to hear what they had to say. But the one thing about them, man, they were like John. If they caught you, you were going to know what they knew. Amen. They weren't bashful. They were going to come at your heart. So he said, look, man, that, that, we'd be like that. Man, that dude mad. That dude don't even know me. I'm trying to get to the sixth floor. And he is here trying to preach to me a sermon between the first floor and the sixth floor. He mad. He out his mind. I ain't paying no attention to him. But he didn't care. He was doing what he believed the Lord called him to to do. So he says, for John the Baptist didn't spend time eating bread or drinking wine. Anyway, he's talking about partying. And you say he's possessed by a demon. Then he talks about himself, the son of man. On the other hand, <laughs> talk about himself now. John is over here in the wilderness, but the son of man. On the other hand, I don't think we today, some Christians don't like to hear about Jesus on the other hand. They think that Jesus was John. That he was out in the wilderness eating wild oats and honey all the time. But on the other hand, where John didn't drink no wine, Jesus turned water into wine. On the other hand. Because he said, the son of man, on the other hand, Feast and drink. So Jesus drank a little something, something. He feasted and he, yeah, he ate, he parted a little bit. Jesus went to part a little bit. I mean, he feasted, he feast. I mean, you know what a feast was? Y'all know, you don't see. Feast. He went to the feast. And when he went to the feast, he may have drank a little wine. I mean, ain't no sin in drinking wine. Amen. The sin. The, let me be careful how I say that. The sin is drunkenness. Now, I'm not endorsing any of you all to become wine bibblers. Amen, because I know in striving, 
there's a good possibility that 50% of y'all drank a little wine anyway. It's a good possibility. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I, I'm just, you know, I don't know the spirit telling you 50%, maybe seven, not maybe all. But there may be some striving them got a little wine in their refrigerator in the cabinets. I mean, ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing to go on. Oh, man, you leave that alone. But so, so, so the point I'm trying to make, the, the sin of drunk, because sometimes we beat up the folks who just got a little wine. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a little wine. Because sometimes I used, used to tell you, you know, uh, uh, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach. When his stomach was upset, drink a little. The, 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 I don't know that. Do you think that was different, Major? I mean, I remember I went to the doctor with cholesterol problem. And he said, You ought to drink your little wine every day. Red wine. Look at that. I said, What? I got license. That's medicine. <laughs> I can have eight ounces of medicine every day. I mean, that's what he told me. And then he gave me the history about, you know, you study the European countries and the, and the Mediterranean countries, those people have less heart disease than we do, and they eat just as much cheese as we do. The only difference is they drink wine all day long. <laughs> they, have, they have wine with every meal. Major, I, I'm just telling you, it may have some healing properties in it, Major. All the medicine that we use come from something that God created. But I'm not endorsing. Don't get me wrong. I don't drink alcohol. I, I don't drink at all. But look, I had to change my thinking on this matter because at one time I was hard on everybody who did. And the people in striving knew that. And they would not drink in front of me. Anytime I went to something, they all sit there like none of them had no wine. No desire. Because I was there. <laughs> but one year on a cruise, on that little boat cruise, that night cruise, some of them got bold enough. And I looked up and there was wine floating around on the table. I said, I can't believe these rascals finna drink, finna drink this wine right here in front of me. But then I had to catch myself to say, the wine wasn't a problem. Drunkenness is a problem. So wine happens to be my pet peeve because I don't drink. You know, I don't encourage people to drink. But I've grown now to where I don't call people drinking a glass of wine sin. No. Go, go ahead, man. You just want to say something. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Sister Myrna. When Jesus was eating and drinking with people, and did with every different kind of people, it wasn't righteous people. He was drinking with people that he wanted to, for them to, to feel comfortable and come to him. Amen. You don't have to be afraid of serving him. Because in him trying to show them that, it, it, try, it make them feel like he and them was equals. Okay, well, well, you know, your point is going to be made when I read this next. And I saw your hand, Sister Mary. Let me read this, and then you can speak. He says, so the Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drink, and you say he is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Now, look at that. So, Sister Mary, go ahead. After I read that, go ahead. You got something you wanted to say? Okay. Um, about the wine situation, um, I remember about five years ago, I had this big bright idea that I was going to start drinking some wine. I, I haven't, I don't drink. My, my goal when I turned 21 was to get drunk as I could, but I ended up becoming a Christian at 20, so I never really indulged. So I, I figured if I could drink that wine, like studies had shown that it, it, it lower your cholesterol, it help your heart. So I went to my doctor and asked him what he thought about it. He said, you'll have better results getting you some grape juice because it's that, that, that enzyme or that, the darkness in that grape juice that really helped the cholesterol, not the alcohol. The alcohol just kind of make you mellow. 
but um, make your heart settle down. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. But um, but that being said, I, I didn't never drink the wine. I just got me some grape juice, and I drank me some of that every now and then. Amen. And I think on the Welch's grape on the Welch's grape bottle, they used to have that. You know, good for heart health. On that 100% pure dark grape juice, it tells you that good for heart health. But but I ain't gonna shoot you if you. If, if you feel like you want a little, a little strength to your grape juice. <laughs> Look, I ain't going to shoot. Wait, I'm just telling you, man, I ain't going to shoot you. I'm not endorsing it, man. Y'all, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling nobody to go out and buy that no Chevy's Regal. <laughs> so, so, so do you think that Jesus... The darkness that was in that grape juice that Jesus drank, do you think it, it didn't have no fermentation working with it? You know, when I was in the other, another denomination, when we got to this part of the Bible, we tried to change it up a little bit. And we added to it. And we said, yeah, Jesus did that, but, 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 but uh, what he did, it wasn't fermented yet. So it wasn't real wine. That's what you say. That we need when Jesus did the miracles and wine. It wasn't fermented yet. And that made us all feel good because we were trying to justify not drinking nothing. But then we read on. I got older and read on. It said the folks said it was the best stuff they ever had. And it was at a wedding. And they knew the folk went to wedding to have fun. And wine was a way to make the wedding merry. Now, I'm not endorsing one, because I don't make my statement clear, Major. I don't drink alcohol at all. And at one time, I used to criticize or condemn anybody who did. But then as I grew, read this passage of scripture, and said, okay, yeah. So as long as people don't get drunk, if they choose to have wine or grape juice for their hearts, see, that's on them. So if pastor come to your house, you ain't got to hide it. If you got to just let it sit out there. If it sit out there all the time, don't, don't hide it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm mature now. I'm grown up now. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you may have had to, had to hide it. Because I would have probably said, I can't believe my member. But now, but now, yeah, we beyond that. But, but what do y'all think about this? When you say, this is Jesus talking about himself now. This, this is in red. He said, the son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, plural. And you say he is a glutton and a drunkard. Talk to about Jesus. He's talking about these same kids now. You got two extremes. You got one when you ought to be joyful, and then you got the other when you ought to be sorrowful. You got John, who you call a madman, and now you're calling Jesus a glutton and a drunk. Which one of them you gonna believe? Wow. <laughs> he says, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors, bad people, and other sinners. So Jesus hung out with people that probably offended the religious group in order of that day because his assignment was to reach those people. And in order to reach those people, he had to fellowship with those people at times. But his intent was to make sure that they received the gospel message, not to condone what they were doing if it was sin. He says, but wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. Their righteous living demonstrate the validity of the wisdom that Jesus and John taught. That's what he's trying to say. If you follow John's teaching you're going to be all right. Because John was a straight up strict guy, you know, when it comes to righteousness and living right. If you follow Jesus, teacher, wisdom is going to say you're going to be all right. Because John's teaching is going to lead you to Jesus. And, and so we see here that, that, that the decision, that dilemma that they had, that Jesus said, hey, man, y'all just like children. And you should be happy because you're playing ball and you're not. You should be rejoicing. Amen. Then you're like children who should be weeping because what's going on 
and you ain't even sorry. And so you got both John and Jesus here, and you ought to at least be happy with one of them. Just be happy with one of them. Because if you get John, he's going to lead you to Jesus. If you get Jesus, you don't need John's message because Jesus got a message of his own. Wow. Now look at this. Let's go on because I want to finish this up. It says in verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Something that was uh, Simon, we'll find out later. Uh, so Jesus had no problem hanging out with religious folks either. So he got an invitation, he went. He didn't say, you know, uh, you know, you Pharisees, y'all do this, this, and this. I ain't got time to hang around with y'all. Hey, he was hanging with publicans and sinners. Now he go hang with the religious folk. So that ought to tell us that, you know, we can hang with people who think they're super religious, and we can hang with people who sinners. From one extreme to the other. The gospel message will work on both of them. Because the super religious sometimes need to know Jesus too. Just because you're religious don't mean you know Jesus. Amen. And then it says, when a certain immoral woman, some say she may have been a prostitute, Major, from the city heard he was there, eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Most of y'all know this story. So now, at that time, whenever a rabbi or somebody came to town of notoriety, even if he was at a person's house, a lot of people came in just to hear what he was talking about, to sit around the words, sit around the table, to hear the discussion that was going on. And as this woman, however she got in there, she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now, the woman was displaying some acts of love, kindness, humility, you know, all those things. Because to kiss somebody's feet, man, you know, today that dog just don't hunt. I mean, that dog, that dog don't hunt, you know. Now, some of y'all may kiss your husband and wife's feet, you know, to make them feel good, you know. Some of y'all may do that. I mean, that ain't, that ain't no problem. You got kissing feet. But this woman kissed Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. In public, Major. And she didn't just put cheap oil on him. She put expensive perfume on him. On him. You know, some other parts, uh, accounts, made it look like the disciples, some of the disciples had a problem with that. They don't, it, it's not recorded that way here, but it looked like, okay, you know, she don't need to be putting that. We could get that and we could, we could sell it. And we can feed the poor with it. We can do all kinds of stuff with it. <laughs> Instead of letting her put it on you and on your feet. Y'all got to get the picture. See, because you know, those of you know this story, know that she was doing what should have been customarily done for Jesus when he came into the house. Feet should have been washed. He should have been given some oil for refreshing. That was the custom during that time. And here this woman is who's there, who's exceeding the, the standard. Now look at this. Instead of the Pharisees seeing that and embracing that this lady who had been a sinner was coming to Jesus, they saw it as an opportunity to attack Jesus. Because look what it says. When the Pharisees who had invited, the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to him, self. What that mean? Major, when you say something to yourself, what does that mean? You thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you said it to yourself, that means probably Brother Purdue don't know what you said. Myrna, even though she's sitting around you, don't know what you said, because you said it to your own. And a lot of times, when we talk to ourselves, we don't even be talking out loud, we just be talking in our head. Say some things to our self. We all do it. Amen. Don't sit here and try to play me. Ain't you? All of us say some things to our from time to time. 
Amen. And, and so now he was saying some things to himself. He said, now look, but he was thinking in a critical way about Jesus. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. If he all that he say he supposed to be, he should know that that woman down there kissing his feet, man, she's, she's a sinner. And by her touching him, she is defiling him. He, he is letting this woman publicly defile him. And he walking around talking about he's a prophet. He don't even know a prostitute when he see one. <laughs> How can he be a prophet? You know, I... I, I you know, every now and then you have, you play the scriptures out in your mind. And, and, and I started thinking, not ladies, not no derogatory way because prostitution is real. I don't know if it's still good today. But, you, you know, most of the time, you knew a prostitute when you saw one. I mean, you go to these cities now, you don't have to be too smart. You walk down the street, there's just some, a, a look. Now, and, and again, I'm pretty sure ladies to be an equal opportunity person. I'm pretty sure there may be some male prostitutes out there now too. I don't know, they walk the street and all that kind of stuff. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this man knew who this woman was based upon what she had done for a living. And he's saying Jesus, if he was a prophet, should have known that too. And I believe, and you're going to see, Jesus knew that. He knew what she was. But because of who he was, he had no problem with her touching him. Whereas the religious leader probably would have, hey, hey, get, get away. Get away, you can't. Don't let nobody see you touching me, man. They see you touching me. Look here, I'm going to be considered defiled and I got to go and go through purification. And so now look at this. Look at what Jesus said. Then Jesus answered his what? His thoughts. Wow. So that means that when he was talking to himself, he thought that nobody heard him but himself. But Jesus answered his thoughts. Didn't answer him. He answered his thoughts. Man, boy, that's some power right there, you know. But sometimes you can look at people long enough and you can almost, in your mind, think of what they're thinking. Just by something they do, something that's their facial expression. You can be there. And you may be wrong sometimes, but sometimes you may be, you know, something like, man, what you thinking? Well, where your mind at? You know, what you, what would make you ask somebody? What you thinking? Because you're looking at them. You're seeing the expression on their face. The fa their forehead got wrinkles in it and you ain't saying nothing to them. So what you, what you thinking? Something must be going through your mind that got you perplexed because, man, your, your forehead all frowned. Ain't nobody even talking to you. You know that people out there who make a living that read people's body language. They can tell by looking at them whether they're lying, whether they're telling the truth, by their body language, by their eye movement, by their head movement, by just the sound of their voice. So he says, Jesus answered his thoughts. He said, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Now, Simon thinking he's going to come and you know, give him a little applause here. Go ahead, teacher. Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. You know, he finna slap him, but he ain't going to hit him hard with his fist right off the bat. You know, sometimes, kind of like when Nathan went to see David, he was ready to slap him, but he knew he couldn't just go and slap the king. Say, you low down, dirty dog, you took Bathsheba and, you know, kill Uriah. He had said that David probably would have killed the boy. Even though he was a prophet, man of God, David would have killed him. But he had to tell David a little story. You know, that was this rich man who had all this stuff, all this stuff. He, man, he had everything he needed. But that was this one little poor man. And all he had was a little ewe lamb, a little lamb. 
And when the rich man had a visitor coming to him, guess what he did? He went and took the man's only little lamb and slaughtered it for his friend. David said, that low-down rascal. <laughs> he, he needed to be put to death. <laughs> and then the prophet said, you are the man. Sometimes, husband and wife, you got to win your husband and wife with a little story. You can't just tell them straight up, they done did this. You got to give them a, give them a little story. Z, you know what it's like when I'm out there on the golf course and you know I'm, in, I'm, just, I'm just six feet from the hole. And if I can get this hole, I could birdie it. But I hit, I think it got it lined up and it's just about to go in on a blade of grass. Change the course of it. And I miss that birdie. And I feel a certain way when I miss that birdie. That's how I feel when you do this to me. <laughs> That's how I, you, don't think, you, don't, you don't think that away, man. You don't think that away. <laughs> but you, but you, you're just telling your little story. That's your little story. How you? <laughs> Let me go and finish reading. <laughs> Because <laughs> that little story ain't gonna work. Well, let's just look at Jesus, how he told his story. He said, now, then Jesus told this story. A man loaned money to two people. Five pieces of silver to one, and I'll say $500, and 50 pieces to the other, $50. Neither, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave both, gave them both, canceling their debt. Then he asked, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Now, Major, she ought to understand how much you love golf when you said that, how you felt. But just in case, we're just used to money here. And <laughs> Jesus said, now you don't need to be too smart to figure out who's going to be the happiest. <laughs> <laughs> Neither one of them could pay him. But that dude that got away with $500, you know, he's going to be a whole lot happier than dude that right. owed him $50. And, and so now the point he was trying to make is this is the same thing that applied to people who are coming to the Lord that feel like they had a greater sin debt than others. Some people self-righteous and don't feel like they need to serve Jesus much because they didn't have many sins when they were coming up. And there are some people who come to the Lord really broken and contrite and say, man, all that wrong I did when I was out there in the world, man, I want to make it right now for the Lord. I'm going to put all that energy and all my energy in trying to do the right thing now compared to what I did when I was out there in the world. Whereas some people, I didn't do that much out in the world, so I really don't have to give the Lord much because he ain't had to deliver me for much. I never drank. I, I never parted like that. But you were still a sinner. You were still a sinner. So he says, Simon answers. So Simon said, you know, Major Simon answered. He kind of sounded like you, Major, tap dancer. I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. Jesus said, now that's right, Major. That's right. Simon, you got it right. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, he turned to the woman, but he said to Simon, looked at the woman, but he was talking to Simon. He said, Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me no, no me water to wash my, the dust off my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Man, Simon, you didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Simon, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head but she has anointed my feet 
with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. And she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. So that, that may cause us to answer, uh, ask the question, how much love do we show the Lord? Can our love of him be measured about, about how much we think he forgave us? Meaning that if I didn't think I did that much, so therefore I don't owe him much. But if I did a whole lot of dirt while I was out there, then I owe him more. We all owe the Lord a debt that we couldn't pay, can't pay it. So therefore, regardless of how much our debt was, whether it was the 500 or whether it was the 50, we should all serve him with the right heart. We should all give him our best when we serve him because he is expecting that because he has already paid our debt. Man, because he done paid our debt, Major, we ought to be happy about that. We ought to be excited about that. And Simon should have been excited for this woman, but instead he was critical because he was so caught up in who she was and what she was doing versus the fact that she needed a Savior. Because in his mind, he didn't need a Savior. And he didn't have enough inside of him to see that she needed a Savior, but he wouldn't even offer that salvation to her. Sometimes people, their hidden prejudices keep them from going to people that need the gospel. We kind of have biases that's already built into us in certain areas, and therefore we already think that certain people is not worthy of salvation. So therefore when those hidden biases take precedence in our lives, then now we will only talk to and witness to a certain type of people. Because hidden in our mind, we think, oh, that person, man, if I was a prophet, I ought to know what she do or he do for a living. But Jesus came for all. So therefore, we should be open to reach out and, and witness to all people, Amen. not just people that we consider to be better than some. He said, now look, I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, and she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, and look at this, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Who is this man? Now they sit at the table there with him, and now they, some will take issue because they're thinking that only God can forgive sin. Who is this man who goes around forgiving sin? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith in me has saved you. Not your works, but your faith has saved you. And now you can go in peace with God. Because when you accept me, I bring peace between you and God. And so therefore, that's why the Bible says, you know, that we can have the peace of God and the peace with God. I have peace with God because of what Jesus did. God is no longer mad at me. I'm no longer fighting with him. I'm at, we at peace now. But then now when I get to that next level and I have the peace of God, that's something that's on the inside of me that caused me to have that peaceful mindset and that tranquil mind even in the midst of a storm. We ought to have both of those pieces. We ought to experience both of them. Peace with God and the peace that comes from God. And so Jesus taught some powerful lessons in this, in this chapter of Luke and I hope that you got something out of him because he touched on a wide variety of topics and things and he made some powerful comparisons. So I would encourage you you know, you get time, go back and read it again, take a deeper dive into it, and, 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 and see what the Lord will reveal to you as you be like a Berean and go back and study the word for yourself. Amen? Let's give the Lord a hand cup of praise. Now, thank you for your attention tonight.